Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 30. The Big Free O. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And this is it. Now we are into our 30th show already, into the 30s. Oh, it's great. And check out our back catalogue because we've got 30 people you can listen to. Well, 29. <laughs> <laughs> or 30 after this week. Yeah. Now, th- there are actually people, though, I see on Twitter and that who've just found the show recently and they're like, you know, blasting through all the early episodes and stuff. So. Oh, great. Yeah, you've missed some good stuff. But also, this week, we have an amazing guest. Now, this guy's been described as the inventor of PC game audio. This is how big we're talking this week. Yeah, and, you know, he, he ran a thing, which was a giant barbecue in the 90s called Project Barbecue. Mm-hmm. And that basically made everyone stick to a format and kind of, you know, control the direction in mm-hmm. which game audio was going. So he's done over 200 compositions for games. This guy is massive, and he is... George, the fat man Sanger. (laughs) Now, uh, this guy, if I mention a few of the games he's been involved with, um, Wing Commander. Oh, yeah. Many at Mansion. Yeah, Seventh Guest. Loom. Loom, Loom, one of my all-time favourite games. And, uh, yeah, literally, this guy, you know, he's been there since pretty much, you know, he got got into it in the arcade era. Origin uh, Systems, LucasArts, you know, really, really interesting guy. And he's very funny. He is. And he's just at the moment with uh, Jerry Ellsworth, doesn't he, on YouTube? Yeah, so there's a a little Commodore connection in there somewhere. Yeah, so he's going to be on the Retro Hour. The Fat Man on in around half an hour from now. Now, uh, there's something big coming up tomorrow as well that we've been talking about. Yeah, tomorrow, if you're in Nottingham, come down to MPGX, which is at the Mercure Hotel. And (laughs) I'm probably saying that wrong, but that's at 1pm and that's... In Hockley area of town, so it's kind of opposite the National Video Game Arcade. I will be there. Come along, say hi. We'll now, have a laugh. We are releasing the show on Friday, so as in tomorrow, we do them in Saturday, 30th of July. If you're listening yep. after that, it's finished. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Sorry, you missed it. <laughs> but um, I'm sure you'll have some stories to tell next week. And you're recording a podcast down there as well, aren't you? Yeah, so? and I'll be doing some interviews with people. There's going to be some uh, old retro guys down there. Also, they're going to be giving away an Xbox One with oh, a one terabyte drive for a raffle. So, yeah. Nice. And discount tickets. So check it out. And I'm at a wedding tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I'm going to write my best man speech. I've done it yet. <laughs> Still haven't done 24 it. Hours. Oh, God. <laughs> It'll come to me, I'm sure, after a few yeah. drinks. Right, let's get into this week's news stories then. Now, this one. Oh, my God. We've been waiting for this. Sega, Sonic fans... Our dreams have finally been answered. We're getting, essentially, a new 2D Sonic game. Oh, my God. It's great. Sonic Generations was the last one, but that was a bit of a remake, wasn't mm-hmm. it? And it, this was, it was good, though. Oh, it was an awesome game. But I think, you know, this game, if you watch the... Um, it's kind of all around Sonic the Hedgehog's 25th anniversary, the reason that this has um, come about. And it's a game called Sonic Mania. Do you know the story behind the, the guys who were involved in this game? Uh, no, no, not at all. Well, it's a guy called, um, he goes by the nickname of The Tax Man. Okay. <laughs> okay. Guy, Christian Whitehead's his name. There's another guy called Stealth on this as well. And uh, these guys were actually responsible for the Sonic 1, Sonic 2, and Sonic CD HD updates. Ah, okay. So, Oh, wow. So these guys, I mean, you know, they're really well-respected updates, really done very faithfully to the original um, games. You know, they didn't mess around with them and make them all pseudo 3D and all mm. that kind of thing. But these are essentially massive Sonic the Hedgehog fans who Sega have gone to and said, look, we'll give you guys a job of doing this new game. It just looks fabulous. It looks like everything I've waited for for all these years. You know, with Sonic, I really got annoyed when it it, it went 3D and it was good for one game on the Dreamcast. Sonic Adventure 1. Yeah, yeah. and Two that was, was right. it. And the music was a bit annoying. Some of the angles were a bit annoying, but they never really got it good. But the 2D formula... It's always wicked. Remember Sonic CD? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, these guys, they did the um, the Sonic CD port to Steam. You know, these yeah. are the guys that are behind that. And that, that's such a, an amazingly well-done port. So, you know, these guys are totally the right guys for the job. And you look at it as well, and it, it is kind of those old-school 16-bit sprites and yeah. everything that it uses. Uh, but there are also some nice little effects, like when you hit an enemy and your rings fly off, they actually circle towards the screen and fly off behind you. Nice. And you know, the thing is, all these people were chasing the technology, like Worms trying to go 3D, Sonic trying to go 3D, everything. Mm-hmm. But, you know, stick with a 2D. Yeah. It's the best fun. What's interesting about this as well is, I mean, Sonic team are not involved in this. No. They're working on, um, apparently, I think their next project is going to be, you mentioned it, Sonic Generations 2 they're working on at the moment. Okay. So Sega are in a proper throwback vibe at the minute. Yeah, you know, they're yeah, really going totally. back to the roots. But it's... Um, I think Sonic's a weird franchise now because you've kind of got two paths. You've got the guys that love the 3D kind of new stuff and, you know, the retro heads who grew up with the Mega Drive and want more of that kind of thing. That's it. I, I, I think the 2D stuff will probably get more popular, though, because they just bring back people's memory. 
know? Well, you know, they tried to do it with Sonic 4, didn't they? Yeah. And the physics, and it didn't feel like an old-school Sonic game, but... No. Looking at this, I mean, they've essentially kept the old engine. Um, you know, it's really faithful to it. But there's also a new... Um, have you seen the drop dash mechanic that's no, in it? No, no. So, you know, the old Sonic games, if you'd be spinning around the, uh, the, the, the hoops, tubes and all yeah. in the hoops, and then you'd, you'd drop down, you'd stop, and it'd slow you down a yeah. bit. Whereas now you can drop down and dash at the same time. Oh, cool. So, <laughs> that's cool. It, you know, it just means that you, you can blast through it even quicker. It's yeah. uh, And one thing I was reading about this that I think is absolutely awesome. Now, this is based on a thing called the Retro Sonic Engine. Okay. that these guys made to upgrade these games. But one of the things I had in mind when writing this engine was it should run on DirectX on the PC, but also it works on the Dreamcast. Ah, cool. So maybe there will be a port, or even with the newly cracked Saturn. <laughs> maybe go into that. Well, apparently this engine out of the box will run on the Dreamcast, so a lot of people are saying you know, they might actually release um, Sonic Menu on the Dreamcast as well as a little kind of nod to the past. Well, uh, another thing you may have seen in the media about Sega is... Sega are releasing a Mega Drive, rah, 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 80 games, but they'd already released it. This is the <laughs> one we've been talking about. <laughs> like, it's, it's really weird because it's a company... Now, obviously, we mentioned the, the NES Mini last week, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's been massively successful. So. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I think it comes out like October, November, and made a lot of the mainstream you know, press and everything as well. But I've seen it in like, the Metro covered it, and um, a lot of the mainstream websites have all of a sudden... Been talking about this um, this console. It's by a company called At Games. Yeah. It was a third party thing that Sega give their approval to. You know, let them slap the Sega branding on there. But like you said, it's been out for a couple of years now. It's yeah, not and, a new and product. They're, and they're also saying, oh, it'll be available with a portable version. And it's like, yeah, they've already got one. It's on sale in Argos. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe they just put a new press release out, and suddenly all the all the press bited. And went, oh, Nintendo's out. Maybe Sonic. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> well, like, well I, I saw it in the Metro, and they were like, you know, Sega's bringing out a new Mini Mega Drive, and it's not Sega at all. It's this third-party company, and sticking a label on the front. And the thing is, it's not very good either. No. I'm going to give you an example now. Okay, this is um, someone's done a YouTube video here um, of this at Games console because it comes with 80 games built in. Now, yeah. 40 of them are kind of um, homebrew versions of Sega games. They're not even the originals. Wow. Okay. So. And you can play cartridges in there as well. Well, but the emulation that it uses, it's not actually original hardware, it does emulation. It's but, good that you can play cartridges, but... Listen what it does to it. This is Sonic 1. Sega! Listen to the music on this. Oh, nasty. <laughs> nasty. <laughs> oh, yeah, it sounds like, like a, a, a really bad emulator or, you know... It's yeah, just not got uh, the speed there. It's not at all, no. It's like, uh, it's a really dodgy, like, you know, cheap little emulation box, really. But, you know, all, all the press are going wild over it. So, uh, yeah, if you've been reading it in any of the mainstream press, Sega are not going to be releasing a new Mini Mega Drive, unfortunately. Although, you know, the main now, now that Nintendo are doing it, you never know. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. be a bad little shout. And also thank you to Andy Baxter for um, sending the Sonic Mania story to us as well. It was yeah. uh, n- nice. always nice to get user-submitted stuff. So Yeah, saves us searching around. <laughs> saves us doing work. Yeah. <laughs> you can send it uh, at Retro Hour UK or on our Facebook page. Now tell us about Tomb Raider Live in Concert then. Well, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, orchestras doing versions of music. and uh, Chris Hulsbeck. Chris Hulsbeck, yeah. yeah, and uh, Fat Man later will be doing some talking about that. Um, well... There's a celebration of Tomb Raider music, and uh, Tomb Raider, of course, was a massive British brand, uh, gaming brand. Now, they're going to be doing this at the, I'm not going to say the Ivertam, sorry, this is some stupid sponsorship, at the Hammersmith Apollo <laughs> <laughs> on Sunday the 18th of December. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always been the Hammersmith Apollo. Yeah, it's always been. Brand names before. And it. it's uh, the uh, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra wow. that are doing it. So this is going to be massive. They're going to have um, three giant screens and footage with 20 years of the past franchise footage. So you'll probably have all the different shapes of boobs <laughs> throughout the period. <laughs> morphing. Yeah, morphing, yeah, to the music. It'll be really good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually quite interested in going to it now. Uh, but I mean, what I love about this is we're looking at this article on Retro Gamer, and it does actually, props to the guys at Retro Gamer, they give it a shout here and they say, you know, originally made its debut on the Sega Saturn. A lot of people forget it was actually a Saturn game before the PlayStation. Yeah, it came out really early, didn't it, actually? It was, um, it was 25th of October 1996. It's 20 years old wow. in October this year. So, But what an amazing celebration. The Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, it doesn't get any bigger than that. 
No, and that would be epic. You know, I, I don't know if I can remember some of the Tomb Raider tunes. I might, might have to go home and listen to the original soundtrack. Really. Funny enough, I was watching a YouTube video yesterday and it was... Um, it was a video talking about the music of Tomb Raider, actually, and the guy okay. just let it play out, and like you know, you forget how good it is. And obviously, it's back big style now, but I think you know there is something those early, you know, three D games, even just playing it on the PlayStation, seeing all the textures kind of breaking up. You know, looking back now, it looks very primitive, but at the time, it was you never seen anything like it before. Well, she was the PlayStation's icon, wasn't she? Absolutely, yeah. Even though she was born on the Saturn. So. Yeah. There so, you go. <laughs> if, you want, if you want to attend this uh, concert, uh, we'll pop all the links in the show notes at theretrohour.com a week before Christmas as well. That would yeah. be amazing, wouldn't it? Now, this story quite surprised me in the week because uh, I actually didn't realise he was still making them, but they finally made the last ever VHS video recorder. I, I guess they would have been making them because of converting VHS to other stuff. So remember you had in the early 2000s, those dual VHS and DVD players that your granny would get so she could play both <laughs> of them, you know. You can still get those, actually. I saw one in, um, I think it was in, like, Curry's or something about a month ago, yeah. but it was, like, 400 quid. Well, I guess that's why they're uh, stopping them now, because uh, there's not much of a market left for those. And the professionals who are converting probably have some old, beautiful machine, <laughs> you know. Well, I've been um, archiving a lot of my old videos recently, and yeah. uh, I found like an old video recorder in my mum and dad's because they've been moving house. So I've been getting all my stuff out of there, but I found loads of old tapes and that, you know, even watching old TV adverts from back in the late 90s and stuff on them, so it's pretty cool. But yeah, my, my old video is a bit grainy, so I was thinking I could do with a new one, but um, looks like I, I may have just timed it right. Yeah. <laughs> but even looking at this as well, what's quite surprising is it's a Japanese company that were making these, apparently the last one like in the world that still had a production factory going. And they still sell 750,000 a year, the wow. VHS videos. Yeah, God, so. there, there must be a demand somewhere. We'll have to try and find out that uh, small market of VHS. It's... Well, it was in Japan as well. I mean, Japan's always been quite a weird market as well. Because remember in the early 90s, like, VCDs were big there, weren't they? Yeah, VCDs were massive. Yeah. And they still are. I think VCDs still got, you know, a, a sizable market out there, yeah, I think. Yeah, it never really kicked off here, did it? No, not at all. But I remember, like, you could get FMV add-ons like the Philips CDI and all that kind of thing that would play VCDs. Yeah. But it was really for the Japanese market. But apparently the, uh, they are going to be stopping this uh, production of VHS videos at the end of August. So... Uh... You got oh, about a month IP if you want to get anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now um, it seems to be we're getting a new Amiga game like every week at the moment. This is an old one that's just surfaced, is it? Yeah, this is an old one. So um, this guy basically rescued it from his older uh, Amiga, mm -hmm. and it, he had it on a hard drive since 1992. <laughs> and right. It was a Blitz Basic game. Okay, I remember Blitz. But it's rendered in kind of pre-rendered graphics. Like pseudo 3D kind of thing. Pseudo yeah. 3D kind of little ray trace stuff. But it works incredibly well. Like I had a little look at the demo and uh, the menu obviously looks like it was in Blitz. But uh, to me, this looks like it could be a retail Amiga game. It's called Center Court 2 because uh, Center Court 1 was released. Uh, but this is the follow-up. Okay. <laughs> Well, this is quite interesting as well. So, um, yeah, nine, 19 years it just stuck on his hard disk. So, it, oh, the hard disk was from 1992, but he made the game in 97, it says here. And uh, he, apparently the head was stuck on the platter, so he had to rescue this 64 megabyte hard disk like to, to get it working again. Probably put it in a freezer. That normally works, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, there's and, all tips to get them going again. <laughs> Blitz Basic, though, is quite a, quite a powerful platform as well. I remember those stuff like Skid Marks was written in Blitz. Yeah, yeah, it's a very fast language, wasn't yeah. it, Blitz? Um, because I remember there was Amos as well, which was the Amiga programming language. And yeah, uh, yeah those were the two main ones that like 90% of PD games came from. But also you could kind of get professional looking titles out of there if you really put some effort in yeah i mean the, the reason i used to do stuff in it but it was all like you know <laughs> look like what your, your three-year-old brother would have done this on the spectrum yeah, it wasn't yeah, a, same here well that impressive but it um, was hard with those early game making kits you know well this is a, a prime example of a great game and you know it's all complete and playable yeah we say 99 percent complete 100 percent playable uh, a little teaser picture as well. So over the next few days, um, I mean, this thread is six pages long in the AB at the moment. I think they're looking for someone like to do a WHD low kind of version of it and that kind of thing too. So yeah. that'd be a website and uh, a link that we can stick in the show notes when the game comes out. So Oh, there'll probably be a CD32 release of this, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those CD32 conversion guys are always on the lookout for new stuff, yeah. aren't they? Now, speaking of uh, new stuff for old systems, uh, this is pretty cool. Have you seen the retro receiver? 
The retro receiver, no. Now, it's a, a pretty simple idea, really, but it lets you play your Super Nintendo uh, with a wireless Bluetooth controller. How does that work, then? Does it just plug straight into the Nintendo? Or? Yeah, so you get um, a little Bluetooth uh, dongle with it. Um, you plug it into the front of your Super Nintendo, just pair them, and then if you look at it as well, they've actually made their own versions of the pads because Nintendo are really precious about their trademark, as yeah. we know. Um, they've called this the 8-Bit-Do gamepad. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at it, I mean, it's the American version with the uh, the Palmer Violet buttons. I think we've described them as before. Yeah. Um, but essentially, you know, it, for all intents and purposes, it is a Super Nintendo gamepad. That is insane, because what they must have done is they must have somehow hacked this receiver so that it's receiving power from the Super Nintendo. Yeah. Yeah, to communicate with the um, little Bluetooth controller. That's mad. They must have diverted the power that was usually sent to the controller. Yeah, well, just be like a little 5 volt on some, or something on one of the pins, I imagine. Yeah. But what's really cool about this controller as well is, not only does it work with the Super Nintendo, but also it works with the PS3, PS4, PC, Wiimote and Wii U Pro. Oh, that is wicked. <laughs> so it's like, you know, wow. it's just a Bluetooth controller, essentially. Yeah, so it's, yeah. uh, you know, great for emulation, that kind of thing. And it sells for $19. So it's like... And I guess they could do different versions of this. They could do, like, original PlayStation pads, or they could do, you know, awful big um, Atari Jaguar ones. <laughs> no one wants. <laughs> so I don't know. Well, I think it's just cool because, you know, obviously these companies are not making these old controllers anymore. And, you know, after a while, controllers get a bit sticky and a bit unresponsive. So having something like this, it's not like a, a cheap, like, knock-off one where it looks completely different and plays different. But also, we're, we're so used to wireless now. Like, when I get my old consoles out and pull the wires out, my mates are tripping everywhere. Yeah. We play a game of worms, and the amount of times that the cat nearly gets strangled by the controller <laughs> cable is, like, crazy. But you're right. I mean, even if I play, like, my Dreamcast at home, I've got it set up on my big TV. Yeah. And, you know, these days, you know, when you're a kid, you sit right in front of the TV, but I've got a 50-inch telly in my living room. I don't want to sit right up to it. And I need, um, it's in my PS2, extension cables. Yeah, you so need to drag enough. the whole system out and then, yeah. Well, so I've got the, I've got them off eBay, these little extenders, but the cable ends up being about, like, you know, about 20 metres long, then, you know, <laughs> snaking all over the floor. That's it. But I remember, you know, I think the first wireless controller I got was the, the Wave, Wave Bird on the GameCube. Okay. And they're, like, really rare now. They go for, like, 80, 90 quid on the... On eBay, and that was an official Nintendo one, but obviously they never brought one out for the Super Nintendo, so it's uh, it's just cool to be able to play it like that, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And the fact that you can play it on emulation as well, awesome. So uh, the Apple One is a machine that obviously is very, very rare, and uh, one surfaced on an auction website, then, eh? Well, this is a pre-production unit. Okay, and, well. And uh, it's dubbed Celebration, because it's the only one that was known in existence, and... Uh, it's got different sockets and components to the original Apple One. So this is a complete unique machine. And they're saying, you know, it'll probably be around a million pounds um, on bids. That it's gonna I reckon at to least. Draw. Yeah. yeah. I think all the original Apple Ones were, but this would have been hand-built by Wozen, wouldn't it? Yeah, totally, totally. And uh, this is probably constructed in a garage in California. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Apple Garage. The Apple Garage, yeah. So this is a, a complete unique piece of history. And seeing Apple is one of the biggest companies in the world now. Um, this is like their heritage. and <laughs> Yeah, I think it will probably get a bit more than a million. <laughs> well, I mean, like, like you said, they, they are the biggest company in the world now. I mean, you know, if, if you were Apple, you'd probably buy it. Just have it in your in your archives and stuff or put it in like a museum and reception when you walk in. That's I just like stuff that. was and have him in a case. <laughs> 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 but what I love as well about, you know, it's got... Um, because, you know, all the original Apple machines, they came with these kind of home-printed manuals and stuff yeah. in the ring binder, didn't they? Yeah. And you got that original um, Apple logo there as well. Um, I think it's Isaac classics. Newton's on it, isn't he, I think? Yeah. And it's uh, it's just, you know, 1976 that was made. Crazy. And who'd have thought that, you know, 30 years down the line, you know, the new iPhone's coming out in a few months, it's like... Well, you'll definitely make sure the battery's not in there anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if that leaks <laughs> or any of the in it, I think, yeah. <laughs> But what's really cool about this as well is um, it's actually going to be on a charity auction website, the saying. Okay. So 10% uh, of the proceeds are going to go to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society for LLS Research. Ace. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you're one of these in your collection, if you've got, you know, a spare million or so in the bank, then uh, it will pop links to the auction. We'll yep. just look, we'll look at that and drool. <laughs> <laughs> now, we did mention last week about this um, quite unique new piece of Amiga music. Um, yeah, and it's got even better. You know, we were playing our little sample of the Tanks tune. Well, Marvin's gone fully out with Martin, 
and they've uh, they've done a tune with Marvin <laughs> singing on it all about the Amigas and Tanks and uh, this is a Retro Hour exclusive, guys. Now, if you missed it last week, if you didn't hear last week's show, uh, just to quickly recap... They essentially found this um, old Amiga 600 that the British Army were using for... Um, it was to play audio in a tank simulator, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, a guy we know, Marvin, lovely guy. He actually uh, managed to get hold of this. Uh, a couple of guys involved in this little project here as well. Rescued the data from the hard disk that was still living there for like 20-odd years. And uh, there's kind of all these samples it used to play in the simulator. So they've turned this into a proper song. Now, last week when we were doing the show, we got sent a little 10-second sample. Now it's like, what, like three, a three-and-a-half-minute epic now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think there'll probably be remixes coming out. And it, they might even be a demo or something. We'll see. This is just screaming for a new tank-based Amiga game, in oh, my yeah, opinion. Oh, yeah, definitely. So. I think what we're going to do, because I want to give this uh, song a bit of time to breathe, I think. So we'll play out today's show right at the end. We'll play out this new song. Has it got a name, even? I don't know. I was... Guessing Challenger 2 would be the one. <laughs> well, he has to go with that now. We've officially given the song a name. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we are going to play out that track <laughs> using these old army samples on an Amiga at the end of today's show. But before then, definitely hang around, because for the next half an hour, a guy who's been working in video game audio since 1983 onwards, over 200 games under his belt. George the Fat Man Sanger. And we'll see you next Friday. Ciao. Welcome to the show, George, first of all. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate you joining us. Um, now, let's get the, the first question out of the way. I'm sure you get asked this all the time. We'll Why are you out. called the fat man? Why the fat man? <laughs> I, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you the real reason since we've got a drone on for a half hour. Uh, I, I had a lot of semi-important gigs in Los Angeles. They weren't really important. You know, I, I got to press record on a digital recorder in L.A. And since my boss was the only guy in L.A. with a digital recorder... I got to go around to a lot of high-profile gigs in L.A. I got to uh, record the digital masters for all these records that were being transferred from tape to vinyl. So while they're pressing records, they, there was this novel thing. They were also recording digital. So I got a lot of very cool sort of credits, and I thought that I was really awesome <laughs> because, you know, I'd worked on an Elton John CD, and I'd sat in a studio for a while with Peter Gabriel and that kind of thing. So when I moved to Austin shortly thereafter, I thought that I was going to be a big hot shot. And uh, it didn't happen because people are just too friendly in Austin. And they're not like in L.A. People say, uh, what do you do for a living? You know, what do you do? And you meet people in Austin. And they say, what are you having? And that's one of the reasons I moved there. But I didn't catch on like wildfire like I thought I would. And I was griping about that to my brother one day. I said, uh, you know, I was going to be the guy who said, you'll never work in this town again. I was going to be the guy who was going to put his feet up on the desk and smoke a big cigar and, and charge people twice what everybody else is charging it would be like, you know, $10 an hour. I was going to be the fat man of Austin. <laughs> and so my brother just very sarcastically, <laughs> he just started calling me fat man. Like, yeah, hey, big shot. Hey, fat man. How's it going? <laughs> that's, that's why fat. And then when people meet you now, you're quite a slender guy. People must be like, oh, hang on. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's always been like that. And uh, and I was even slenderer. Um, <laughs> but uh, but a lot of times they would also, you know, before meeting me think, you know, because the, the world was a different place before the internet. And it, it was hard for people to get a picture of you. So, uh, you know, people thought that they were going to meet this great, big, imposing, mean guy. And really, they were scared of me sometimes ahead of time. So my life had a lot of episodes of people thinking that I was going to be a big jerk and finding out, well, you know, I'm kind of not what they thought I would be. And it's kind of a feeling of relief. So a lot of people have been relieved when they met me. Not that I wasn't fat, but that I wasn't, you know, the fat man with the big cigar. <laughs> I, I guess you were um, kind of raised in a musical background then if you were in the uh, kind of 60s surfer California town. Yeah. Uh, well, my my mentor, when I was in when I was in middle school, they drafted me into the high school band uh, because they needed trumpet players. And the director of that band was one of the great surf musicians. He was the leader of the band, the Astronauts. Um, 
which uh, when they would, I don't, I don't know if this means anything to people now, but uh, when the astronauts and the Beach Boys would tour Japan, the Beach Boys would open for the astronauts. So this incredibly charismatic uh, surf guitar playing dude was my mentor uh, for six years of my life. Um, and he taught me how to play guitar. He taught me how to play bass. And he, he taught me the trumpet thing too. But he was also, he was, a, he was in a surf band, but the surf band was from Colorado. So they were so the cowboy surf thing did kind of creep into my mythology in a, in a weird way the sort of surrealism of a, a surf cowboy band it, it kind of got in my blood um, so yeah uh, and musical background I mean that's just marching band that's not music but uh, but there's a lot of showmanship involved in that well you had this really strong background in music but what actually got you into um, computers and do you remember the first time that you Really used one? Used a computer. Well, yeah, I, I did something with uh, I did something with punch cards in college. Uh, I think I tried to make a random number generator. I think I tried to I, th- I tried to just do a, you know a dice throw game. Computers and I didn't really like each other that well. Oh, actually, I built a little uh, mechanical computer out of a model kit. My grandpa bought it for me when I was like twelve or something. But no, that doesn't count. I really got into it in the gaming side when. Uh, uh, when I got an Atari 800, w- got that because I had written a tune for an Atari 800 game. So I, I rationalized getting the actual computer. I used that computer to, I actually programmed a little uh, software synthesizer on it. Well, the 800 had a good sound chip as well, didn't it? It was, um, you know, like the Apple machines and stuff at the time. Was it kind of that that attracted you to it then? Was it more the, the audio side of it that got you into the Atari? Uh, no, no. It was the fact that there was a gig. Um, it was, it was, it was so, so the first tune that I did it was, uh, my brother's college roommate. So Dave Warhol was in the games business and I was nuts for games. Um, and I said, you know, I'd like to be in that business. I said, I'll, I'll take out your trash for you for free. If you just, you know, give me something to do, just, just get me in the business. Um, and, uh, he said, well, you write music, don't you? And I kind of shyly said that I did. You know, I have, a, I have a degree in music, but I really don't feel like I clobbered that degree. I feel like I kind of squeaked by. And uh, so he said, yeah, write a, write a tune for this in television game, Thin Ice. And so I wrote a 10-second tune. And uh, then that, you know, nothing else happened except uh, a relative of a friend heard that I had done that. And he said, would you write music for this other game, mm-hmm. um, which was... Was it Way Out or Capture the Flag? Capture the Flag was the two-player version. I, I wrote the music for that. Uh, so that was on Atari 800. So he gave me, actually what did attract me to it, guys, was the, the fact that, it, that he gave me the music composer cartridge. And I was able to put music into the game, or I was pay, able to put music into the computer one note at a time. And I'd never been able to do that because there was no such thing as MIDI or anything. And I'm just too dyslexic to actually play an instrument really well. By being able to say, okay, this is going to be an E and it's going to last half a beat and it's going to be followed by a G, which is going to last two beats, uh, you know, and just clicking that in with all those keystrokes, all of a sudden I was able to sort of sculpt the music so that it would play back the way that I wanted to. I would have been just as happy if they'd have given me a player piano and a hole punch. And so, you know, but I kind of felt like I knew what sounded good. So once I got on that Atari composer thing, I was able to put things kind of in order, and that was nice. And that kind of carried me through a couple of projects, and things dried up for the, you know, the great game crash of, what was it, 1984 or 5. It wasn't too long after that that MIDI came out. And once I got hold of MIDI, once I could program into the computer what notes to do in what order and then change them when they didn't sound right, I really felt like I was, I was realizing what I... It, it turned out that I actually was capable of composing something. Because up until then, I wasn't really sure I was. Well, you mentioned that you were into uh, games before you um, got the Atari. I mean, was it more, was, were you down the arcades? Were you playing those kind of games? Yeah. Well, in high school, we, there was a pinball arcade, and it had, uh, but there was one electronic game in it, uh, Space Race. It had other names, right? It had other incarn- incarnations, but it was Space Race. It was, you know, rotate left, rotate right, thrust fire before mm-hmm. asteroids. And, uh, uh, but then it, in college, there was just pinball, but uh, I discovered a uh, missile command game down at the grocery store, and you got to understand this is a. It was a different. It, it was like you were discovering something. It was like when the 
Beatles had a few friends with a few American 45 RPM records and they would drive across town to listen to those records and nobody else knew why they did it. Nobody else thought it was cool, but they and their friends thought it was cool. It was like that. Nobody was forcing this stuff on, on us. We discovered it and we shared it with our friends and it was like we had our little underground network of what was cool. So, uh, you know, finding Missile Command in a grocery store and playing it and going and trying to explain it to people, you know, what what the game was and how it was played. And then I think in the next year or so, they put in a couple of our electronic games in the pinball room at school, at college. So there was um, there was uh, Asteroids and uh, Space Invaders. All the classics. Yeah, and I just loved those games. Loved them. And there was a Pac-Man, too. I guess there's a... And that, was the, that was the beginning of it, yeah. I guess there's a big connection between pinball machines, slot machines, and early video games, even maybe with the sound. The similarity of the sounds is abstract. You know, it's like, what are the sounds used for? That's interesting. Uh, but, the, but yeah, arcade games and pinball games, they were like the same thing. They were showed up in the same places. They were used for the same stuff. The, the electronic machines kind of grew out of the pinball culture. So if you wanted to play... Uh, electronic games you went to the pinball arcade and found the few electronic games there so I, that seems obvious to me but it may not seem that obvious to people who didn't grow up when i did um and then uh as far as the similarity in sound yeah you know what they, they did start to have chips in the pinball games right around when they started having electronic games but before that the the, the pinball games went ding 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 and they were mechanical they were bells the interesting thing is though how the sound interacts with the gameplay and i think that that's key i think that what i learned from slot machines is that you want to communicate very clearly to the person what they've done that's good bad potentially good potentially bad but but you want to you want to give them a true feeling that their odds just went up of doing well or the odds of their odds going up just went up um and that's what you want to communicate to them plus the theming you know the theming being you know if it's an underwater game you want to come you know let them know that they're underwater well i think in those days as well i mean you, you know you mentioned the sounds in the arcades and to me that was a big part of the experience i mean you know if you, you close your eyes and you, you're back there again the sound of it was such a <laughs> massive part of it just hearing all those machines playing at once like oh yeah it's like it just because graphics then were limited you had to kind of use your imagination a bit more but audio was such a massive part of the experience wasn't it oh yeah it was really big it was really big and and, and you know everyone remembers dump bump 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 yeah. bump 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 and and that's uh you know a simple case of you know, you could almost play that game with your eyes closed. And that was always my goal for slot machines is like, can you play it with your eyes closed and know what's going on? And I think that that's a good rule for any any game audio. You know, it, a, a good design uh, goal is like if the person can play the game with their eyes closed, uh, you've done the audio really well. Uh, but but uh, yeah, the, the, the sound of all those games going and so that's that addresses the individual game and the individual experience. But the mass experience is fantastic. Uh, and I especially liked big rooms full of slot machines as I got into it. And as they became less limited, people were writing their music in all kinds of keys. And it started to sound really discordant and awful. But before I went in and, and now recently, I think people have realized it's not a solo performance when you're writing audio for a slot machine it's not a solo performance it's a it's a jam and guys the key is c so so you're making a great big c chord with a whole lot of other composers and sound designers and it if you do it right it's going to be really beautiful and and i think you know it's like a big ohm you know it's transcendent you mentioned the uh, 1983 84 video game crash i mean you know that was kind of the early part of when you when you said you're getting into the industry then um obviously it all kind of went away for a little bit did you kind of think oh well, yeah. that's it it's over now then or did you see it coming back absolutely absolutely and i'd already gone through you know just not long before that around 82 the band broke up you know going into college i thought i was going to be a physics and math uh, physics and engineering major but uh, you know the band the band well come on, George, we're going to make it in the band. So I switched my, very dutifully, I switched my major to music and tried to be a great member of the band. Well, that band broke up and then the next band broke up. And finally, you know, just in, in 82. And I didn't know, then I, I didn't have a marketable skill. 
so so I thought, wow, it's going to take off now. You know, I got an Intellivision gig. I'm going to do games. And I, I got maybe like a little burst of three games right there in, in 1983 and, and four. And then, yeah, it petered out. And I was right there because the, the, the third thing that I did was that a couple of guys kind of surfaced who were doing – it was going to be a demo cartridge for the Atari 800. It was going to, it was a little cartridge that you were going to put into your 800 and put up on display in your store. You know, the screen would, would flash attract features and it would play, you know, it would say, uh, a computer is also good for typing things into, and it's good for business. Look, it's a calculator. And it would, you know, show things on the screen and play noises. Anything but games. And, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 but these were incredibly smart guys. We're, we're programming this thing, but but right there, it was like we're trying to figure out what the Atari is. So that was that moment, and and Atari had just it was just changing hands, uh, and it was like it it was there was something happened business wise with the Atari, and I leave it to you you historians to go back and figure out what the heck happened. But I tell you what, it had something to do with the Atari uh, nose diving, and that was a big part of the whole sort of chain reaction. I don't know if it was causal or if it was a result of, but uh, in television went out, Coleco went out, you know, everybody, everything just went out. It just it felt like you were in a desert. It was a, a, um, a bit strange here in Europe because we had a lot of the home computers at the time, so uh, it kind yeah. of wasn't affected that well. Were you aware of like composers like Rob Hubbard? And uh, Dude, over I was games. so freaking unaware of anything other than the stories I was telling myself in my head. When I went to my first game, computer game developer conference, somebody said, George, you're the only guy I've ever heard of who does sound for games besides Rob Hubbard. And that was where I heard of him. Oh, so okay. that was, no, I was unaware of him. I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times. I consider him a friend. Uh, I have infinite respect for him. But at the time, I thought that the things that I was doing were the things that was going on. I didn't even think about Japan and I didn't think about Europe. I didn't think about the Amiga or the Commodore. I only thought about the things that I was doing. And and I hope that the world will forgive me for that. <laughs> well, the world was a smaller <laughs> place then, wasn't it? I mean, you know, you weren't on it, the web every it was, day. And... There was, a, yes, you weren't on the web. You, you, you went to the computer game developer conference so that you could talk to uh, other people were crazy enough to do this stupid thing, which was video games, which was pretty much like, you know, it was like a bunch of hobbyists who wrote music for toasters. You know, it just it didn't make any sense. It was not an industry. But you know what, guys? I thought it was a revolution. I could see that it was going to be something big. But uh, for, for, you know, during the crash, it was scary. And then when it came back uh, with Nintendo, that was a beautiful moment. But it wasn't very long after that that those awful Hollywood games started coming in. You know, it's like, okay, here's a platformer. Uh, it's Dick Tracy. Here's a platformer. Oh, it's the same platformer, but now it's Total Recall. And I, I'm embarrassed to say that, but my very good and brilliant friend, uh, Dave Warhol, who got me into the into the industry, did do the Total Recall game and the Dick Tracy game. And, uh, you know... I, I'm I'm not the most proud of those. I, I when I think of games, I think of really the the bizarre, abstract, adventurous things that happen. You know, like the first first person shooters. And uh, uh, what's the best example? What what is that? What is that one that doesn't make any sense at all? Where you've got a big knob and you turn it or vortex? No, is is that what it's called? You've got a big knob and you turn it around. The tempest. Tempest. Yeah. That's the one. To me, games are tempest. You know, that's what you want to do. Every game is its own interactive, creative adventure. And then I think that that's happening in the indie games. And I think that it's happened to a large extent in the, you know, in the, the, the flourishing of the, you know, iPhone games and stuff. Sorry, with us, um, we'd basically had 8-bit kind of samples for a while and there was no MIDI and stuff. And uh, then, well, the early... 8-bit sample stuff was Wing Commander and when that came out that kind of blew my socks off because uh, when it loaded up you could hear the orchestra tuning up their instruments at the beginning yeah <laughs> it was just yeah, amazing that, that was that was amazing that was us and uh, and I'll tell you what uh, my we wrote that for the MT32 so we had an advantage it almost wasn't 8-bit you know for us it was 
what was the MT32? It was like 12-bit or 16-bit or something like that. I think 16 and then it 14. reduced down or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was beautiful. And then when it got transferred to FM chips, that was the work of Mark Shafkin. And he's a, he's a good guy. I was actually in a band with him for a little while um, called the Captains of the Chess Team. And we just did nerdy, nerdy tunes. But that was, you know, maybe five, uh, seven years ago. But Mark's still around. He's still in the business. But he was the guy who did the hard work of taking my MIDI files. I'm not sure, but that might be just one of the very first games that used MIDI. Not in the game, but they let me make my MIDI compositions and then handed in the music as a MIDI composition and then basically handed over the MT32 and said, Mark, this is your reference. This is what each voice should sound like. It's the voice on the MT32. And so he did really the hard work. He was he was the one in the engine room shoveling coal into the furnace. You mentioned like games that were kind of otherworldly and uh, you know a little bit different. There's one game that you know I remember being a kid and I always I still think it's a beautiful game, and that is Loom, um, the Lucas Films game, which I um, I know there's an adaptation of uh, Tchaikovsky's oh, yeah. Swan Lake on there as well. I mean that at the time I mean I've never heard classical music reinterpreted into a game before. <laughs> was that was that game really special or did you, did you think that was like something it was, completely new? It was really special. Um, the the guy uh, Brian Moriarty. I just adore him, and and it was his idea to use Tchaikovsky to use Swan Lake, and he sends me the sheet music for the Tchaikovsky pieces. Now, I've heard classical music on MIDI and on computers, but for some reason, I don't think that anybody, they must have, but I've never found it. Nobody was doing tempo changes or dynamics. It was a great game. It was a great combination, and you know, art too that was that was i remember the ad for for loom said you know they hired real artists you know and 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 that was a i mean think about that does anyone say now you know (laughs) you're gonna love this new you know this new doom 4 we hired real artists (laughs) what does that even mean (laughs) are these the guys who crucify themselves to volkswagens i mean a real artist you know this guy in a beret what is it but they uh, they actually get got people who did art for a living and sat them down with some kind of dithering palette tools and really you know like I said again earnestly tried to do something emotional and beautiful and uh, wherever you put that kind of love care and attention into into making something beautiful it tends to pay off maybe not directly maybe maybe sometimes it only pays off in terms of the story that people tell afterwards uh, but I have a, a lot of faith in in acts like that. Well, speaking of games as well that were kind of groundbreaking, I remember, you know, seeing Seventh Guest for the first time, and that was probably the first, like, CD-ROM horror game back in the early 90s. Um, was that an exciting project to be involved with? Oh, my gosh, yeah. Well, it was, you know, it was the first, uh, it was almost the first CD-ROM game. I mean, it wasn't the first CD-ROM game. There, 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 were, there were CD-ROM games before that, but they weren't properly using you know, they weren't written for CD-ROM. Yeah, like Mist, and that was just images and stuff, wasn't it? But it wasn't like full motion video and all that kind of thing. You know, I don't know if Mist was before or after. It was just about the same time. Mm. But but it wasn't using up the the CD like Seventh Guest was. And uh, uh, also, you know, mostly what people were writing for <laughs> for, for CD-ROM was encyclopedias. So so Seventh Guest came out. Actually, Mist Mist was a hypercard stack. It was a, it was a slideshow. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with class, Seventh Guest was unbelievable. I mean, that 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 first shot where you go up the stairs, I, they sent me a, a VHS videotape. Uh, uh, Graham Devine surfaced kind of out of nowhere. He had been to my talk at Game Developer Conference. He was in awe of me because I had done music for Wing Commander and Loom. And, uh, you know, which which is like, oh, thank God. Thank goodness, there's there's somebody in a position to hire me who actually is buying into the mythology. This is great, you know. So so he called me. He was nervous about talking to me, and and believe me, I, I, this still blows me away to to think that I could even hang out with a guy like that, let alone have have him respect me. And then he sends me the videotape of going up the stairs in Seventh Guest, and I was like, I am so in. This is so great. It was unbelievable. Yeah, I was excited about it. I was so excited about it. And they gave me a little, they gave me points on the game, which was unprecedented. So I negotiated for points. They were very generous about it. 
Um, so I, I actually got, eventually I got enough to buy a car off of that game. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then, and then it wasn't long after that, they Virgin just stopped paying royalties to anybody and, and nobody ever figured out why, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but it was a great moment. And I, and, and I knew that anything that I could do to make that game better, uh, to make it more appealing, to make it sell more, to add value, anything I could do, I would do. So there was this great sort of moment of dialogue where I said, Graham, uh, this new format, CD-ROM, I said, is it like a CD? He says, well, yeah, sort of is. I said, is it, uh, could you do CD music on it too? He says, well, I'm not really sure. I said, uh, well, would it be okay if I just like did a bunch of actually recorded music and you could sort of include it with the game? He said, sure, fine, man, whatever you say. So, so I did. So I was like all in with that game and I did a bunch of stuff that they, that they weren't, you know, it wasn't part of the contract, but I just wanted to make it cool. And it, 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 it all came together. It was a good moment. And when it sold, you know, you say, well, wasn't that one of the, the first horror game or whatever? Sherlock Holmes Adventures was the biggest selling CD-ROM game up until Seventh Guest. It sold, I think, 60,000. And uh, Seventh Guest came out, you know, right out of the shoot with a million and a half sales. So it was actually the launch of CD-ROM as being a viable industry. Because before that, we used to joke about it. Everybody was into CD-ROM, like everybody's into VR. But unlike unlike it, nobody had made their money yet. So the joke was we called it uh, multimedia the billion, the zero billion dollar industry. That one megabyte in a CD-ROM, wasn't it? <laughs> People just putting floppy yeah. disk games on them. <laughs> yes, yes, we didn't know what to do with them. People don't know what to do with VR and AR now, too. Well, um, but it's, it's sorry. One uh, reason we know you as well is because of the Fat Man and the Circuit Girl. And uh, being Commodore fans, we're very big fans of Jerry Ellsworth. So, uh, how did this come together? We had a friend in common. Do you, do you know who it is? He wears a top hat, Scott, Jason Scott, uh, who invited me to come out and speak at Nauticon slash block party which is a little nerd convention and demo party. And uh, he said, you've got to meet Jerry Ellsworth. And so he uh, s- introduced me to her and, you know, we hit it off all right. I don't know if you guys are, are into the demo scene. Oh, massively, um, yeah. Yeah, oh, great. Okay, so, so I, w- I wasn't. I was just learning about it. And it, incredible. But so it, one of the things about the demo scene is if you make a demo and if you win a demo competition, you are remembered forever. I mean, it's huge cred in that community. It's they crazy. remember the winners yeah. of the competition. So I, this is, this is absolutely the biggest piece of leverage I ever did. The least, the most glory for the least effort. Jerry had an, an FP, uh, F, FPGA. Come on. Was it? FPGA. Yeah. yeah. Field programmable gate array, uh, circuit board that she'd built. And, uh, she was going to program a demo in hardware. She said, could you write a tune for it? So I wrote a little MIDI tune and I handed it over to her and we won the sort of a wild card award. So I've got cred now in that group as like having won with, with Jerry this, this great competition. So, so she, you know, all, all that it actually did was it, it lit up the word lame on the screen <laughs> and, 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 played the, and played a tune. <laughs> You know, did a little bit of flashing, but it was doing it in hardware, and everybody loved it. She's so incredibly smart. Uh, so later on, we, uh, you know, I, I really didn't know what I was doing for a living right then. A lot of my uh, of what I had been doing had dried up, um, and uh, uh, I was I was looking at maybe trying to be smart for a while. So uh, uh, we got together a little bit and 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 uh, put together the idea for that show. And if people haven't um, seen it, it's, it's one of the most interesting shows on YouTube as well. It's such a good watch. Oh, I'm glad you think so. I did, are people still watching it? Well, we are because we're <laughs> we're really into all the uh, FPGA stuff and even like your mouse traps, quite cool with the uh, peanut oh. butter on the end and stuff. You know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, was, I mean, she was uh, she was always coming up with with uh, crazy great stuff. And I, I learned a lot about about the uh, about the demo scene, about hackers. I, I love I love you people. I mean, it's, it's great. And, and when someone drops a code word, 
you kind of know who they are. And some of the code words, are Arduino is probably the biggest. Yeah. If somebody says, yeah, I've been working with an Arduino, you're like, I know who you are, <laughs> and I know what you want to do next. What, what you said about the demo scene being remembered forever, though, is, is so true. I mean, we go to shows now, and then you'll you meet a guy, and you'll be like, oh, I did this demo on the Amiga back in 1992, and everyone's like, what, it's you? Like, we're not worthy. <laughs> yeah, <totally. laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't it great? It's like they, uh, and, they were so visually impressive, that they and, or the sound, that they just stick in people's mind. It's, uh, oh, the sound and the, the, the visuals and the, the packing. Uh, did uh, you ever look at the disc mags as well? Because we used to have a, a scene in Europe, which was basically, it was like you'd get discs and people would just make songs on them and they'd try and outdo each other. And there was even a European chart where you'd get a disc with like the top tunes of that month on it. It was crazy. Now, what's it called? Disc Max? Mags. Disc magazines there yeah. were, yeah. Oh, disc mags. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no I, no, I didn't know about that. That sounds very cool. Yeah, we had I lots. love that attitude of trying to outdo each other. You know, that's at the core of some of the best creative efforts ever. And I love the attitude of, you know, are we doing this for the money? <laughs> no. Yeah, you know, totally. that's beautiful. We're doing it to yeah. outdo this other group. <laughs> you know, it's, uh... Well, I mean, you look yeah. now on the, on the Commodore 64, there's still demos coming out on like, you know, people are still looking at this 30-year-old hardware and being like, we didn't know you could do that on it. How are you doing that? Wow. <laughs> yeah, good. It's fantastic. I love those guys. I think that, you know, I, there's somewhere on YouTube, there's, you know, George Sanger's message to the demo scene. Um, and, and the message is that, that, that those people have something that a lot of the game scene let slip away. You know, a lot of the indie guys still, still have it now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it's that sort of earnest, uh, creative, exploratory uh, drive and passion, but, but passion's a cheap word. Passion doesn't just mean staying up late and working hard. You know, but passion means uh, not being afraid to sort of face the question of, you know, is this beautiful or not? Do I want to do this? Uh, making bold, creative decisions. Uh, doing things that people might not like. Doing things that haven't been done before. If, if, if you haven't done something that, when you do something that hasn't been done before, it's not like in the movies. It's not like, you know, and I'm thinking about inventing the bicycle. Yes, I'll invent the bicycle and then everything will, you know, I'm not sure that it's a great idea. Well, when you're not sure it's a great idea, what it feels like is everybody around you saying, that's a stupid idea. And then when you build it, it feels like running out of money and having wasted your time. Ex- unless you really enjoyed doing it and unless you put real love into it, in which case that's passion. And, and it doesn't even get on you. You're like, yeah, I built, I built this bicycle. Check it out. It's super <laughs> stupid. And then, you know, and then you look around and 10 years later, people are going, you invented the bike. You're awesome. And look how proud you are then. Look how proud you are then. Or maybe you go, wow, I never thought that one would catch on. You know? <laughs> and, then, and then you say, you know, well, I also invented the, you know, I also invented the uh, teacup hat. And they're like, well, that's, that's stupid. Yeah, uh, Nolan Bushnell, speaking of the Atari, Nolan Bushnell invented the Atari, he invented Chuck E. Cheese. I don't know if you have that, but, you know, he, he, he invented, uh, you could say he invented Pong. And uh, I've read an article where his daughter's job is like every day, Nolan Bushnell gets up and he has his cereal and he says, I could make a spoon with a right angle bend in it. That would relieve. The- no, Dad, that's not a good. I this chair. I, if if one leg were shorter, it could be a rocker too. No, Dad. I mean, he has thirty ideas every morning, you know, and she's got to talk him out of the really nutty ones, which is usually thirty of them. So yeah, you might be the guy who invented the, uh, you know, who invented the Atari. But you know, what do you? What about the rest of the ideas? I mean, it's not like you just have one idea and you sit back and and are satisfied. And look at Paul McCartney. You know, he did stuff with the Beatles. Uh, he's been working hard since then, too. Does it all get recognized? You know what? A lot of it just kind of doesn't. He also did the Frog um, Song as well. Uh, he did what? The Frog Song. I don't know that one. I don't, I don't know. know. What was that? It, what wasn't his best moment? <laughs> I don't think I know the Frog yeah. Song. I have to look it up on YouTube. Where do I go to get that? YouTube. Okay. I, that. I remember the Michael Jackson one he did with him. What was the Michael? The, what was the Michael Jackson one? Ebony and Ivory was was with Stevie Wonder. Oh, I know. I, 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 Sing it. Calling you, baby. <laughs> <No>. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not quite just the, not quite to Michael Jackson's standards, right? <laughs> oh, I love the songs. 
I love the songs, and that's been a big thread for for the video games too. I mean, getting songs into games has been like it's like pushing teeth. You can pull teeth, you know, but it's like shoving a tooth into the slot and seeing if it'll grow. <laughs> <laughs> well, George, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. Really enjoyed having you on. Been great. Well, Dan, Rafi, it's been it's, it's been a real pleasure. Enjoyed it. And if people want to find uh, out a bit more about what you're up to now, have you got a website or a Facebook or anything people can go to? Well, Facebook's good. They, I'm easy to find. Uh, you know. Uh, the website is, uh, you know, hasn't been updated since uh, I think 1971. And uh, uh, oh, thanks, mom. Uh, and uh, mom's here. Hi, mom. Uh, and uh, uh, but but a fun way to really get full exposure to the to the bizarreness that has been my life so far is to put George Sanger as a search into YouTube, and then you get all the junk. You get a really nice assortment of uh, interviews, sounds, mistakes. Uh, uh, Fat Man and Circuit Girl. That's a that's a great way to 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 really have it wash over you. Yeah, and the Matt Chat video is really good to watch as well. Mm. He's done three of those that are massive. Oh, oh, the Matt Chat. Yeah. Oh, those were that guy's beautiful. He's great. He's great. Isn't and he? Uh, and he got and he got me into uh, he got me into ales too. You know, he does the the ale of the week. Yeah, at the end. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was at the, the end. Yeah. It's like wow, this is the, okay now. Now I'm a better person. All right, guys. Well, thank you. Well, the fact that I'm being a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank, thanks, and and and, and the joy, and thanks. For, I appreciate you doing this, and uh, I look forward to hearing hearing more of uh, of the retro the retro cast. Here, here. Uh, I'll say it again. You can edit it into a smooth thing. What, what's it going to say? It's called <laughs> the, retro the retro hour. hour podcast. So, hey, Dan and Ravi. I'm really happy to have been on your show, and I look forward to more episodes of the Retro Hour podcast. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Loaded! Authority to fire. Here we go.